Pints with Jack, Season 3, Episode 37. The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, Part 1. Good morning and welcome to Pints with Jack, a podcast where two enthusiastic C.S. Lewis amateurs get together, share a beverage and discuss a work of C.S. Lewis. This season we read Till We Have Faces, but it's that time of the season when we get to return to the world of Narnia. And so for the next two episodes, we're going to be talking about my favorite childhood Narnian book, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Oh, it is your favorite. <laughs> Matt couldn't remember. <laughs> uh, so as we leave the comfort of the Eagle and Child pub and we step aboard the deck of the Dawn Treader, allow me to introduce myself. I am Captain David Bates, and we are heading out to sea with my faithful cabin boy, Matt, a scurvy son of a sea dog bush. <laughs> I really like the uh, uh, scurvy son of a sea dog bush. I'm not sure about the faithful cabin boy. <laughs> <laughs> You're not that faithful. <laughs> but let's start with our drink of the weeks. Mm -hmm. What are you drinking? Well, I'm in Georgia right now uh, visiting my college roommate. So thankfully he had some Dewar's White Label. So I have, I've had this before. For those who know, McAllen 12 is my favorite. Mm -hmm. Price just keeps going up and up though. And so Dewar's White Label to me is always my fallback. It's a half, if honestly a third the cost and tastes probably 80% as good. We actually had somebody on Instagram yesterday send me a message saying, hey, what's, what's the scotch that Matt always keeps talking about? So McAllen 12 probably just got another sale of a bottle. So we, we will <laughs> wait patiently for our cut in the mail. I'm hoping not to be. I mean, obviously these are our... Difficult times, but maybe one good that can come out of this coronavirus is it'll drop the demand and it'll finally bring the price back from $78 to 52 which it used to be six years ago. Well, since we're going on board the Dawn Treader, I thought it'd be appropriate to drink some rum. So I'm drinking some of Captain Morgan's rum. Mm, good choice. And our quote of the week is from one of my favorite parts or themes, if you want to call it in the book with Eustace, and that's not saying much. I think that's probably the case for everybody, but I think it's so beautiful. So it says, sleeping on a dragon's hoard with greedy dragonous thoughts in his heart, Eustace had become a dragon himself. Fit so well with the great divorce, fit so well with till we have faces, this false self, true self, authenticity. I mean, it fits so well with Lewis and fleshly sins versus spiritual sins and kind of combining them together, the physical and the spiritual. I mean, there's just so much with what he did with Eustace. And the person we're toasting this week is Mo. And if any of you are in the Slack channel, you will know Mo because he is extremely active. And so Mo, uh, may you go on great journeys in life, you and your wife together. Cheers. Cheers. And I'll have to send you when I'm done, Mo, uh, sent me, just got it, and so I have to read it, the book of him and his wife. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Um, I think he asked for your address, too, and I haven't given him it yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, faithful cabin boy Bush is failing already. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited to read it, though. I'm very excited. I think he, he mentioned in comparison with uh, A Severe Mercy, somewhat mm -hmm. like that, and that, that same theme or same strain. So I'm very excited to read that. So thank you, Mo, by the way. I have received it. So today we're going to begin our discussion of The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And in Dr. Michael Ward's scholarly work, Planet Narnia, and in his more popular work, The Narnia Code, he says that this book corresponds with the sun, because the sun was regarded as a planet in the medieval cosmos. And you can actually even guess this from the title of the book, because it's the, the Dawn Treader. And as we go through this book, you'll notice many references to light and to the sun, and if you have no idea what I'm currently talking about with Planet Narnia, uh, go back to episode six of this season. And I give an overview of Dr. Ward's hypothesis about the Chronicles of Narnia. This idea that each of the books is based on a planet from the medieval cosmos. This is really sad that as you're saying this. Every time I've listened to this, I'm like, I wonder if he's trying to fit this too much into a book. I need to dig more into this. And it's sad that you've already expanded on his whole hypothesis and I haven't listened to it. And this is why you're still a cabin boy and not a captain. <laughs> and not a faithful one. I think I just got downgraded. 
Oh. Well, I am quite excited, and it's also going to make this episode quite confusing <laughs> for me, because we're going to be doing an upcoming episode with Daniel and Phil, two episodes with Daniel and Phil from the Lamp Post Listener, and it's going to be about the movie. So I have, in the last 48 hours, read the book and the movie, and I actually was doing them at the same time. <laughs> like I had a chance to watch an hour of the... I'm serious. I, I finished the first half of the book, then I had a free hour where I was trying to be efficient with my time, so I watched the movie while I was driving i wasn't driving someone else was driving for an hour <laughs> and then then the second half of the book and then watch the second half of the movie later and so it was confusing to see things that have happened in the movie but because the movie shifts things around thus i was I'm, in my head's all over the place so when we talk about stuff i might bring something i really liked and it was only in the movie <laughs> <laughs> so so i'm gonna apologize ahead of time but that's gonna be a great episode it'll be shortly after these are released and they're wonderful people at the Lamp Post Listener. We've met them. Excited to be able to chat with them again. So we're going to do two episodes on the book, and then we'll do two episodes with them on the movies. And I thought we would kick things off uh, with a poem which Mo sent us. It's a big day for Mo. It is a big day for Mo. God, mentioned twice on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> he was actually listening to Reverend Brian McGreevy at the time when he wrote this, and he's someone that we're going to have on the show, I think in about a month. I've already recorded the interview. Uh, but anyway, this is what Mo wrote. Look for types and shadows in here and there, for the light is not hidden to those who are aware. If you think I am dreaming or that eyes can only see, take a trip to Narnia to see our reality. Then look for types and shadows in the light of our little world. There you'll see in wonder the beauty of his precious pearl. For joy flows through the understanding that your watch is not the only time. But there is another more valuable where your shadows are paradigm. Whoa, that is fantastic. He sent it to us a while ago and I immediately thought, OK, Voyage of the Dawn Treader episode. That's when we're going to read it. <laughs> this is great. Well done. This makes me even more excited. I forgot it's, it's the title of his book. I believe you can get on Amazon is In Mary's Eyes. And so... I am very excited to read that because that's quite a gifted poem. <laughs> Clearly got away with words. And this is just a good chance to plug for us. the. What, it's just been wonderful, but our Slack community. So for listeners, this ministry, David and I love to do this. And it's a passion of ours. And we started a Patreon. Uh, it might be a few months now by the time this is released. But let's just say a few months ago, approximately three or four and it's just been incredible. You guys have been fantastic. And so if you if you are enjoying this and you'd like to support us, we would be honored. There's a few different tiers. It helps cover the cost of this. And we're getting close to being able to cover the cost of our existing stuff. And we don't want to stop there because we have so much more stuff we can do with content in our heads that if we get beyond that, trust me, we can easily fill the gap. And uh, yeah, so people who support us at the second tier, which is $5, get a part of our Slack community which has been incredible. I mean, a person put in there recently was talking about reading Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, and seeing all of Lewis throughout it. And then I just asked him, hey, expand that a little bit and gave some of the points. I'm like, yeah, that is very Lewis, right? And all of that. And so there's just a lot of wonderful stuff going on in there. Okay, well, let's kick this off. So first of all, Matt, this was your first time reading this, correct? Yes, and watching. Okay, so just general thoughts, go. So in the beginning with the book, the first, it's 240 pages. And I needed to know this to track my progress to make sure I finished in time. The first, honestly, 70 to 100 pages, I was kind of struggling. I wasn't getting into it. I wasn't capturing much of like these big themes. And I was disappointed. But then there was different scenes that really just blew my mind that got me so excited. So I would say, and I'll go into some of those, but I would say overall, I really enjoyed it. Um, some of the messages were profound. I had a harder time getting into the story itself, meaning like it's suspenseful, hooking me, excited to get to the end. But overall, I did really enjoy it. And again, the things that made up for it were, that made it honestly actually a really wonderful book were some of the themes, particularly Lucy, when she dealt mm -hmm. with some self-worth stuff, loved yep. that. And then <laughs> Eustace, of course, Again, another really that authentic false self true self. So there was a lot here that was very similar to Till We Have Faces. So I appreciate the timing. It was perfect, probably planned out by you. And <laughs> it, I, overall, I really, really enjoyed it. It just took me about 100 pages to get into it. Okay, that's fair enough. 
Well, let's start at the beginning then. So chapter one, the picture in the bedroom. And I just have to read the opening lines. There once was a boy called Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. <laughs> I even tried to look up to see if there's something bad about the name Eustace. It means steadfast. And then I saw there's a St. Eustace popped up and then I just stopped with my search. But I was like, is something really wrong with the name Eustace? Well, the name Eustace Clarence Scrub, it, it's not the prettiest of names. <laughs> and I've heard quite a lot of people say that they think this is autobiographical. You might say there once was a boy called Clive Staples Lewis and he almost deserved it. Yeah. Because Eustace is definitely very much an earlier Lewis figure. It's how he views himself. And if you read his early letters, he definitely was a very smart kid. But ugh, I don't think we'd have been friends. <laughs> you, you are right. Changing his name to C.S. Lewis saved it because Clive Staples, that's kind of rough. Especially now in today's <laughs> day and age, Staples is an office store. <laughs> it's just rough. So we meet Eustace Current Scrub and we hear a little bit about his parents. And you're definitely meant to not like them. Uh, he refers to his parents by their first names rather than mother or mum or dad. Uh, and uh, one thing I didn't realize until I read Joseph Pierce's book on Narnia is that what Lewis is doing here is he's hinting that Eustace's parents are members of the Fabian Society. Uh, it was associated with George Bernard Shaw, and it was this British socialist organization and their purpose was to advance democratic socialism uh, in a kind of gradualist and reformist manner rather than by a revolutionary overthrow. It will be an interesting, there's really no way to answer this since I've read it, but maybe Lewis, his parents were terrible, probably had a bad influence on him. You have to have a little sympathy for Eustace coming in that environment because at the very end of the book, the very last paragraph, he becomes a changed person. Everyone loves it, notices, except his mother. <laughs> I mean, she she was disappointed in this new Eustace. So, I mean, imagine if that was your parents, how you would have turned out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we meet Eustace and we also find out where Peter and Susan are. Peter is preparing for some exams with Professor Kirk, which is something Lewis himself did. Uh, and Susan is with her parents in America because she was older. They thought that she would get the most out of it. And then we move to the scene where all of the children, so that's Edmund, Lucy, and Eustace, they are in a room looking at a, at a picture. And uh, needless to say, Eustace thinks it's a horrible picture. <laughs> but this is when the magic starts kicking in and the picture begins to move. And coming right off the back of Till We Have Faces, I immediately think of chapter four of part two, where Orwell sees the moving pictures on the walls. So a little bit of recycling from Lewis there. Uh, and they then find themselves actually in the picture. And, and the, well, the first of my real notes, I, I underlined the section where it says that Lucy kept her head and kicked her shoes off as everyone ought to who falls into deep water with their, in their clothes. <laughs> and it really reminded me of the line the Witch in the Wardrobe. It's that kind of avuncular advice of one should never shut oneself up inside a wardrobe. Likewise, good life tip. If you ever find yourself falling into water when you're clothed, kick off your shoes so you can swim. He does that all the time. I noticed that throughout the book where he'll explain things or he'll even say things as you would obviously have known because this is a normal thing or he just those types of comments he makes frequently. Mm. And so they find themselves in the water and they're pulled up on board the Dawn Treader. And it's here that they reconnect with Caspian, who they helped put on the throne of Narnia in the previous book, Prince Caspian. Uh, and they also once again meet another fan favorite, Reaper Cheap. Uh, and needless to say, Eustace doesn't like him. <laughs> I, I, I love to do Reaper Cheap before. I love him even more after this book. And I love him the most at the end of the movie, which is different from the end of the book. Mm -hmm. mm. We, we, we can argue about that a little later. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, but speaking of Eustace, uh, he continues to be annoying through most of this book and right from the beginning. And it, it, it's funny how he demands uh, some plum tree vitaminized nerve food. <laughs> and uh, as long as it's made with distilled water. And next season, we're going to be looking at the screw tape letters. Uh, so if people have read it, this really reminds me of what screw tape speaks about with regards to the gluttony of delicacy. All Eustace wants is just one thing. In this case, it's plum trees, vitaminized nerve food with distilled water. He doesn't ask for much. Doesn't ask for much. No, exactly. Um, and then they go to 
Caspian's cabin where Lucy is going to stay because Caspian is a gentleman and he gives up his room to the lady. And in, in the book, Eustace actually complains about that as well. Mm-hmm. She's not doing anything. Why does she <laughs> get this? As if he ever did anything either. <laughs> right. And then we come on to chapter two. And here the Pevensies are brought up to date with all of the happenings in Narnia since they left, including the timeline. And so in Narnian time, it's been about three years, but in our world's time, it's been just a single year. And Caspian explains their quest, and their quest is to find the lords, well, the loyal lords to Caspian's father, whom Miraz sent away to explore the seas. And so these are Argos, Bern, Mavramorn, Octesian, Restamar, Revillian, and Rup. So these are the guys that they are looking for. Uh, but this isn't actually the only quest, though, because Reaper Cheap wants to find Aslan's country. And he recounts a prophecy which a dryad spoke over him when he was in his cradle. Where sky and water meet, where the waves grow sweet, doubt not Reaper Cheap to find all you seek. There is the utter east. Mm. And I'm emphasizing a little bit of the quest here, because when we talk about the movie with the lamppost listener guys, there it's a little different or a lot different. Yeah, confused me. <laughs> confused me and made me angry, but we'll <laughs> deal with that that episode. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they then just have a tour of the ship and Eustace is feeling terribly seasick. So Lucy gives him some of her cordial uh, and obviously he complains about it and the ship and everything else. Uh, the, the, one of the things that struck me just in that little scene I think we've mentioned it before in earlier episodes with Lucy's cordial, that the word, the root word there is core from the Latin meaning heart, that Lucy is always offering our heart to people to try and help them. Mm-hmm. And uh, it manages to achieve something in Eustace, but uh, not quite yet the cure. And you wonder if that's because Eustace wasn't open to receiving all of the grace that was poured into him. Hmm. Now, one of the features of the book is Eustace's journal. And from time to time, we get extracts from it. And I'm not going to read all of them. There's just one that I want to read just to give us a feel uh, for Eustace's writing. And I think there are some quite significant things that Lewis is doing here. So this is Eustace's entry from August 7th. Have now been 24 hours on this ghastly boat, if it, does, if it isn't a dream. All the time, a frightful storm has been raging. It's a good thing I'm not seasick. Huge waves keep coming over the front, and I've seen the boat nearly go under a number of times. All the others pretend to take no notice of this, either from swank or because Harold says that one of the most cowardly things ordinary people do is to shut their eyes to facts. It's madness to come out into the sea in a rotten little thing like this, not much bigger than a lifeboat. And of course, absolutely primitive indoors. No proper saloon, no radio, no bathrooms, no deck chairs. I was dragged all over it yesterday evening, and it would make anyone sick to hear Caspian showing off his funny little toy boat as if it were the Queen Mary. I try to tell him what real ships are like, but he's too dense. E and L, in his journal he refers to Edmund and Lucy just by their initials. E and L, of course, didn't back me up. I suppose a kid like L didn't realise the danger, and E is buttering up to sea as everyone does here. They call him a king. I said I was a Republican. But he had to ask me what that meant. He doesn't seem to know anything at all. Needless to say, I've been put in the worst cabin of the boat. A perfect dungeon. And Lucy has been given a whole room on deck to herself. Almost a nice room compared with the rest of this place. C says it's because she's a girl. I try to make him see what Alberta says. That all that sort of thing is really lowering girls. But he was too dense. Still, he might see that I should be ill if I'm kept in this hole any longer. E says we mustn't grumble because C is sharing it with us himself to make room for L. I said that doesn't make it more crowded and far worse. Nearly forgot to say that there is also a kind of mouse thing that gives everyone the most frightful cheek. The others can put up with it if they like, but I shall twist his pretty tail off soon if he tries it on me. The food is frightful too. (laughs) Oh, you were having fun with that, weren't you? Yeah. Well done. I love and hate Eustace. (laughs) Oh, yeah, he's great there. But the reason that I wanted to read that out is, again, because we're coming off the back of Till We Have Faces. What is Eustace but an unreliable narrator? 
just in the same way Orwell was an unreliable narrator. Now, here it's a little bit more obvious that he has a very twisted view of things. But once again, we see Lewis using a very similar technique to communicate something to us. Interesting. Could could the, the Democratic Socialist Society be incorrect if he's a Republican? Well, would he be different than his parents? I don't know. Usually kids aren't. I'm just going to tell you, I come from a, a, a monarchy. And uh, when I look in the Bible, it's the only form of government I see there. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, p- please join Patreon so you can argue with me about which uh, political system is better. That'd be fun. That's what we should do. Get into politics and people will be so furious if we if we build controversial statements. So they'll, they'll join Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know what we need more at the moment? People arguing about politics. Ooh, not enough people doing it. I know. Uh, uh, and the only other thing I want to say about the journals was it, it, it actually also relates to Lewis's own story because he was a very avid journal keeper. And it was something that he felt that he generally had to let go of when he became a Christian, because introspection is good, but there is a certain kind of introspection which can be bred, which isn't good. And I think that's one of the other things he's trying to show us here, that Eustace is like Orwell in terms of he's complaining to himself. (laughs) Yeah, that doesn't, that almost doesn't even seem like introspection what he's doing. Yeah, definitely fostering his pride. Mm Mm-hmm. And the last sentence about uh, not putting up with Reaper Cheap is, uh, is very appropriate because just before dinner the next day, there is an altercation between Eustace and Reaper Cheap where Eustace grabs Reaper Cheap's tail for a joke. Ooh. And, <laughs> and he soon regrets it. And Reaper Cheap calls Eustace a poltroon, uh, which is a word which I intend to use more in common conversation. Uh, so he calls him a poltroon and challenges Eustace to a duel. Uh, and when Eustace refuses, the mouse slaps him around with the flat of his sword. Uh, and it's, it's very funny. Uh, and uh, Lewis tells us that at the end of the chapter that eventually Eustace apologized sulkily and went off with Lucy to have his hand bathed and bandaged. And then he went to his bunk. He was careful to lie on his side which tells you where he got spanked. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. And this is really where the adventure begins in chapter three, because that, this is where we come to the, the Lone Islands. So this is Felimath, Avra, and Dawn. And this chapter, the line that I've underlined is, Lucy, who had been talking to Rince on the poop. And, and this is where I realized that I am basically a child, because I found that far too funny. <laughs> It's like duty. <laughs> it's like David, duty. <laughs> d- new listeners will not know that. David, do you want to get tell them about how you love and laugh every time you hear the word duty? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like Americans, there's a T in there. Pronounce it, otherwise I'm going to snigger at you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've said this before. Sometimes um, I was listening to a podcast and it was two doctors and they were discussing this one acronym of this actual organization, PN. I S and <laughs> it was the acronym and they both started dying laughing and they're in their fifties and <laughs> like surgeons. And I just, I said, you know what? Boys will be boys. Pretty much. Uh-huh. Pretty much. We're, we're rather basic. Uh, and one of the thing that I, I really loved in this chapter, it's not quite humor, but it's the kind of comments that Lewis peppers throughout his works, uh, particularly the Chronicles of Narnia that I, I just love. He says, by the way, I have never yet heard how those remote islands became attached to the crown of Narnia. If I ever do, and if the story is at all interesting, I may put it in some book. I, I just love it when he speaks to us. It's also, it's almost as if it's like the end of a, a movie that could be a blockbuster hit. So they keep it open-ended in case they need to write and uh, produce another one. It's like he's got another chance for some other books here, offshoots. Mm-hmm. And who knows, he might have actually have planned on writing one of those stories. Uh, but I think at the very least, it's an opportunity for fan fiction. Mm-hmm. If, if the Netflix thing ever does happen and they produce the Chronicles of Narnia, they want to keep using the material. That would be a good jumping off point. Yes. Someone should beat them to writing that. Make a lot of money. Well, no, because they have the rights. <laughs> mm. A landing party lands on Thalamath. And the, the plan is to walk along Thalamath because it's very pretty and then meet the Dawn Treader on the other side. Uh, unfortunately, along the way, they meet six or seven rough-looking men, all armed, sitting under a tree. And it turns out that these men are slavers, and they kidnap them. 
and they start taking their captives to Narrowhaven, which is on the island of Dawn. But before they get a chance to head over, there's a man who appears, and he wants to buy Caspian. And uh, Pug, who is the leader of the slavers, I, I really like his character, he, he replies like this. Ah, said Pug, I knew your lordship would pick on the best. No deceiving your lordship with anything second rate. That boy now, I've taken a fancy to him myself. Got kind of fond of him, I have. I'm that tender-hearted, I didn't ever ought to have taken up this job. Still, to a customer like your lordship... Uh, he, he is just like a smarmy businessman mm -hmm. <laughs> and trading in people, which is even worse. Yeah. And he's anchoring like, oh, this is gonna be a tough one for me to part with. You better <laughs> yes. pay up. The person I've just kidnapped. Uh, now, there was an interesting point in this conversation because you find out the currency of exchange in the slave trading and it's the Calumin Crescent. Now, Matt, since you haven't read The Horse and His Boy, you're not going to know the significance of that. But we're going we're gonna to visit that land at some point over the course of the Chronicles of Narnia. And we're going to learn a little bit more about that culture. And uh, this might be a hint that it's possibly not the greatest. Now, if I had read in chronological order, Boo. would I have read this already? Uh, if you, yes. yes Ooh, you would David. Yeah, but I don't think that's a good thing. I don't think that's a good thing. You don't necessarily want all of your answers laid ahead. <laughs> I just had to throw that out there. Because then when you come to The Horse and His Boy and you read about the Calormins and the Crescents, you'll then remember back to the Voyage of the Dawn Treader and you'll go, of course. <laughs> Honestly, don't even remember those two words until you highlighted them. Well, oh, okay, that's good. Just don't try and fight me on the publication <laughs> order. Anywho, uh, while the rest of the captives are taken to Pug's ship, Caspian goes with this lord and he turns out to be the missing Lord Byrne. And he and Caspian rendezvous with the Dawn Treader and then go to Burns Estates on the island of Avra. And they begin planning the rescue of their friends. And Burn sends some word, some message to Narrowhaven. We don't know what it is yet. Uh, and also at his prompting, they make the Dawn Treader look as impressive as possible. And then they act as though they're signaling to a fleet which is out of sight of Narrowhaven. And that's really important because then in the next chapter, we see why. Because what they do is they make this big show of force uh, the next day when the Dawn Treader arrives at Narrowhaven. And they're greeted by this large crowd and the tolling of bells. And all of this is a result of Lord Burns messages, which he sent the previous night. Notice, notice I haven't like said a ton yet, because this was the part that I just didn't get into. It's a weird thing in my personality trait. I love, it's, it's something I need to work on. I really just enjoy things that are, are advancing my knowledge or intellect or truth. And sometimes you just have to enjoy pleasure for the sake of pleasure. This was good writing, probably a good story. But I was like, okay, where's the theological truth? Where's the first theological principle? Where is Christianity going to pop up in this? Not seeing it yet. And just kind of pushing through until I get to that. Because I'm waiting for the wow. And there was plenty of wow that came. But at this part, I just, yeah, nothing. <laughs> well, don't worry. We're going to get to a wow bit before we end this episode. Good. Uh, now, I don't want you to say any more about the movie, but with the... Freeing of the Slaves, did you prefer the movie or the book? Oh, well, first, before that, I enjoyed seeing C.S. Lewis' stepson. Yeah. Douglas yeah. Gresham. I, I wondered whether you'd recognize that. <laughs> oh, 100%. <laughs> I think I enjoyed the movie better. Oh, that was the wrong answer. Okay. So we will talk about why the movie is terrible <laughs> next time. Uh, but in the book, the way they get their friends free is by making this big show of force, making them seem more powerful than they really are so that they can take control of the island and get rid of the slave trade uh, without a fight. Uh, and all of this begins with this large crowd that meets them at the docks. And Lewis tells us that by the time Caspian reached the castle gates, nearly the whole town was shouting, and where Gumper sat in the castle, muddling and messing about with accounts and forms and rules and regulations, he heard the noise. Mm. And upon meeting some lackluster guards, Caspian commands that a cask of wine be opened so that they can toast his good health. And this is, again, I, I really love the way it works in the book because Caspian doesn't want to fight because they are heavily outnumbered. And so what he does to curry their favor is, well, I command you to go and drink some wine and toast my good health. And yeah, that, that's a command that they could get behind because they were also kind of lazy. And then they meet Governor Gumpus, and he is a complete bureaucrat. 
and you got a hint of that in the little quotation that I gave, messing around with his accounts and forms and rules and regulations. And I do just love the fact how much Lewis hates bureaucracy. Once again, next season, we're going to be looking at the Screwtape Letters. And that is exactly how Lewis thinks of hell. Hell is a bureaucracy. And then Caspian speaks to Governor Gumpus, and he asks him about two things. Firstly, the missing tribute. Basically, the Lone Islands are meant to have been paying the crown of Narnia every year, and it hasn't been coming for years. And basically, unless he can produce it immediately, he has to produce it out of his own personal wealth. And then he addresses the practice of slavery in the island. And when Caspian speaks of banning it, Gumpus says, But that would be putting the clock back, gasped the governor. Have you no idea of progress, of development? And I don't know about you, but that made me immediately think of all the times in mere Christianity and the great divorce where Lewis talks about, if you've made a mistake, it is no good carrying on in that direction. You've got to go back to where you made the mistake and fix it. Also reminds me of Chesterton. Progress for the sake of progress is not progress. But then there is progress because Caspian replaces Gumpus with Burn and makes Burn a duke. And then they go to the market to rescue their friends. And they have all been bought except one boy. <laughs> Eustace Clarence Scrub. <laughs> I love it. And when they ask about him, Pug goes, Oh, him. Oh, take him and welcome. Glad to have him off my hands. I never see such a drug in the market in all my born days. Priced him at five crescents in the end, and even then, nobody would take him. Threw him in for free with other lots, and still no one would have him. Wouldn't touch him. Wouldn't look at him. Tax, bring out Sulky. <laughs> <laughs> Eustace has to feel awful right now. <laughs> and then they prepare the ship for their, their voyage further east. And then that brings us to chapter five. They actually stay on the Lone Islands for about three weeks. And then when they leave, they have some lovely days of travel. But then they encounter this massive storm. And this goes on for days. And we are treated to a series of Eustace's delightful journal entries. Uh, and then we find out that after the storm ends, the wind just dies completely. And we find out that the ship is running low on water. And also that Eustace tries to sneak some water, but is caught by Reaper Jeep. Eustace has been doing nothing up until this point. <laughs> this, oh man, it's frustrated me. So it's like Orwell in some scenes. He tries very hard to justify himself, but kind of fails, even though everyone is still nice to him and gives him the benefit of the doubt. Someone should do a psychological study on Eustace's ability to rationalize and justify his actions. <laughs> Maybe he could go to group therapy with Orwell. Yes. Oof. And then, and we're given a date here, and it's a date that now has quite some significance. On September the 11th, they arrive at a new island, uh, what we'll come to know as Dragon Island. So they all go ashore and they begin their work, mending the casks that were broken, building a new mast, repairing the sails and all that other stuff. And needless to say, Eustace doesn't want to do any of this. So he slips away into the woods and after traveling a good distance, he settles down. And Lewis tells us, quite surprisingly, that he began to feel lonely. And also then he starts to worry that the others might have left without him. And so he rushes back and he gets lost in the fog and he ultimately finds himself in an unknown valley and the sea is nowhere in sight. And then we come to chapter six, which I'm guessing is probably going to be one of your favorite chapters, Matt. This is definitely when my ears started perking up. <laughs> so Eustace basically finds himself trapped in this valley. And there's a pool there, so he decides to have a good drink before attempting the ascent out of this valley. And then he hears a sound, and then he sees a dragon. Although, since Eustace hasn't read the right books, he didn't actually know what it was. And this dragon, it moves slowly to the pool to have a drink, uh, and then it dies. And eventually Eustace goes over uh, to see the dragon and to get a drink from the pool himself. Uh, but then it begins to rain, so he takes refuge in the dragon's cave. And it's full of treasure. And needless to say, he fills his pockets. Uh, and in particular, he slides this huge bracelet up onto his arm. And then he falls asleep on the dragon's hoard. Now, I just want to pause here for a moment, just to point something out, that he is sitting upon gold, which is you know, yellow, makes us think of light and the sun. 
But there is actually also another connection to the sun because Apollo was the sun god. And in particular, he was known for being a dragon slayer. Mm, Maybe not a coincidence. Not a coincidence. And then from that scene, we then briefly cut back to the rest of the group. Uh, They're now starting to get really worried about Eustace. But when we return to Eustace, we are treated to some fantastic writing. Uh, And it's all from Eustace's point of view, what he can see and what he is thinking. And I I was very jealous of the fact that you got to read this for the first time, because I would love to be able to go back to this and not know what's going on. I mean, so I, I loved it. I will say it was one of the more clever things. And he he wrote Eustace's reactions brilliantly. I knew really quickly what was going on, but that's also because I knew we got undragoned and dragon. So in fairness, I, I had a bit of knowledge going into this scene that I knew eventually became a dragon. So I wonder what I would have thought if I didn't realize it. But the writing with the left and the right hand, it's real. I mean, it was really great. I won't say more because I know you're about to go through it, but. <laughs> uh, I it, was it Jerry Root that ruined this for you when we were at the conference somebody referenced the voyage of the dawn treader and I I nearly jumped over and clamped my hands over Matt's ears <laughs> yes ruined it but gave me great material for my talk because the the undragoning it really fit with that journey of when you've built up this identity and you need to undo it you try to do it yourself until you realize you need God's grace to do it so I did need to hear this. God, God wanting me to hear this, David, whether you, you could not have stopped me from hearing Jared Ru- Jerry Root talk about this. <laughs> so Eustace wakes up and he has this pain in his arm. And then he's terrified to discover that he thinks that there are other dragons in this cave. And he eventually makes a break for it to the pool outside. And there he sees his reflection and is horrified to discover that he was the dragon that he saw inside the cave. And the pain in his arm was because the bracelet that he had put there, and he was now much bigger, and it was pincing on his flesh. Lewis writes this. He had turned into a dragon while he was asleep, sleeping on a dragon's hoard with greedy, dragonish thoughts in his heart. He had become a dragon himself. And as Andrew told us in an earlier episode, This is the reverse, really, of the myth of Narcissus. And I would like to suggest that this is Eustace's I am Ungit moment. Mm, 100%. This is when he realized his monstrous desires and everything. And also that they were dissatisfying. And I can't remember if it was right here, but then he started longing for... He had some moments where he realized he was powerful, but then he, he realized he longed for the friendship and the people. So I love this way better than the movie did it. That is the correct answer. <laughs> yeah, book was 10 times better with this scene, 100%. And I'll, I actually want to read that little section that you're alluding to. There was nothing to be afraid of anymore. He was a terror himself now, and nothing in the world but a knight, and not all of those, would dare attack him. He could get even with Caspian and Edmund now. So stop you right there. That's the part where it's like, there's the good of what he desired. I mean, it's not really good, but that's what he thought was going to be the good. He's powerful. He's scary. He can, he can go against all of his enemies and every, there was the fulfillment of his desires. Now proceed with what he then learns. But the moment he thought this, he realized that he didn't want to. He wanted to be friends. He wanted to get back among humans and talk and laugh and share things. He realized that he was a monster cut off from the whole human race. An appalling loneliness came over him. He began to see that the others had not really been fiends at all. He began to wonder if he himself had been such a nice person as he had always supposed. He longed for their voices. He had been grateful for a kind word, even from Reaper Cheap. <laughs> and then Eustace breaks down and cries. Notice here that I actually genuinely believe him when he says he began to wonder if he himself had been such a nice person. There's actually an interesting amount of wisdom or something we can learn in there. Someone who's in that state, very turned within themselves, your favorite term, David, in Cravatus in se, outside of that other Latin one you do to show off on anything <laughs> in Latin's intelligent. <laughs> Uh, quid quid latine dictum sit altum editor <laughs> that one i was gonna be like quid quid dictate 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 yeah that one uh 
He actually probably genuinely believed he was nice. When you're so turned within yourself, you don't actually realize it. And so it's, it's, it's almost that statement, truth sets you free. But a lot of times we can't give the person the truth because they're not going to hear it from someone that they're prideful against. They have to see it themselves. Sometimes hitting rock bottom is what it takes. And that's what it took for him. And I think it reminds us that people who are bad very often don't realize that they're bad. No. And that should worry us a little bit. Because am I, am I bad? <laughs> Do I have this blind spot as well? <laughs> That's where, this goes back to something we've talked about in the Skype sessions. That's where it's very important in the self-awareness to surround yourself with people that you trust their opinion. And honestly, seek it. And ask them, how do you see me? How do you view me? It's an interesting question, actually. I, rem- I remember once I was listening to a podcast and it gave these two questions. Ask someone how they see you from like a intelligence perspective on a one to 10 and a kindness, genuine, authentic perspective. And it was funny. I surveyed 10 friends and just told them to be honest answers and I averaged them. It's kind of fun. (laughs) That is a very Matt response to those questions. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. But yes. Did it help reveal, were you a captain or were you a faithful cabin boy? It did. Um, but it revealed actually was interesting of, of I mean, uh, my brother gave me the lowest on the score of kindness. <laughs> I was like, oh, you know, that's probably fair. I have a little bit more work to do because with your family, with wounds and stuff, you're not as gentle mm-hmm. and kind with friends that you've never had those negative things with. There's no tension between it. So you're, you're fully kind self. And so, yeah, it, it revealed a little bit of with people on the spectrum, the closer they are to you, a family, <laughs> the lower those scores were. <laughs> At the moment, Marie and I are going through marriage preparation. And uh, yeah, we're having to have all of those sorts of conversations. It, 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 it's interesting. <laughs> I'm so excited for that because I love that stuff. Ugh. Do, you, do you want to take my place? Do you, do you, want, do you want to do the marriage prep for me? <laughs> just just like just get, write me up a summary of the things I should know at the end of it. I will. I will. I could probably <laughs> write it for you, David. Oh, thank you. Eustace then has a long drink from the pool now that he's a dragon. And then he eats the other dragon. And Lewis adds one of his comments saying that this is why you so rarely find more than one dragon in the same country. (laughs) I wanted to look that up if that's true. (laughs) Uh, And then he then flies out from the valley. And then we switch back to the other's point of view. And it turns out that Eustace lands between the camp and the boat, uh, which is obviously of great concern to the Pevensies and Caspian. And needless to say, Reaper Cheap wants to go out and engage the dragon in single combat. <laughs> I love Reaper Cheap so much. Oh my goodness. <laughs> but they all decide to go out and meet it. And fortunately, through nodding and shaking his head, Eustace eventually manages to let them know that he's not a threat. And this is when Lucy says, Perhaps it came to us to be cured, like in Androcles and the Lion. By the way, I liked the book better than the movie here again. In the movie, he, when he meets them, he looks all angry at first and they're worried and they're fighting and they're shooting and he's almost destroying the ship and stuff. I'm like, that's not what happened. He came with like his head <laughs> held down in a position of surrender from the very beginning. But I paused because Matt, who's Androcles? Oh my goodness, David. That's why I, <laughs> I tried to diverge and just move on. I tried to get through this real quickly. Androcles... Andoc- Andoc- um, it's a it's a mythology, and uh, it's back in the third uh, BC, third century BC, and uh, you know, there's Apollo in there somewhere, and there's a little bit of Socrates maybe, and uh, yeah, he's just a character. It was one of the god goddesses, gods, gods, of course. Um, yeah. Please tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> tell me more. Tell me more. Do 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 do. Uh, so Androcles and the Lion, there's, there's variants of the story, but it's usually surrounding a, a runaway slave who hides in a cave, meets a lion who has a thorn in his paw. The slave takes the thorn out of the lion's paw. Sometime later, the slave is recaptured and is thrown to the lions to be eaten. And one of the lions runs up and starts licking his face. And it's the lion that he did that good turn for. Of course, if you wouldn't have cut me off, I was getting to that part of the story. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I knew I shouldn't have cut you off too soon. First of all, <laughs> that, that is a great, great short story parable. I've never heard that before. A lot of wisdom in that. There's a version of it in Aesop's Fables, I think. Wow. I'm glad you shared that, actually. I'm going to look that up. So that was what Lucy was thinking of with regards to the, the bracelet that's on his arm. And she tries to heal Eustace's arm using her cordial. Uh, and while it helps with the swelling a little bit, it 
it doesn't fix it. The bracelet is still on there and it's still hurting him. I wondered actually in that scene, what is Lewis trying to communicate there? Because that cordial is very powerful. Mm-hmm. Was it almost saying that God's will is for him to be in this state, in this moment, and happy to offer a little shade in this desert, but we can't take this desert away because Eustace needs to go through it. And like that quote, maybe God loves you more than you love yourself. And a lot of times we try to ease the pain in situations when the pain is actually the grace. Well, it makes me think of my favorite Bible quotation where St. Paul talks about that he has this thorn in his flesh and he asks the Lord to take it away three times. But Jesus says that my power is made perfect in weakness. So maybe that this bracelet and this pain that he's currently feeling is going to serve some higher purpose. Ooh, I like that too, David. And at the end of the chapter, Caspian notices something about the bracelet. And in chapter seven, we find out what he noticed. And it was the fact that the bracelet had on it the symbol of the Lord Octesian. And through playing a version of 20 questions, you know, the, where you, one says, who am I? And you've got to answer yes or no questions. <laughs> uh, they discover that the dragon is someone under an enchantment, not the Lord himself. And eventually they work out that he's Eustace. And of course it was Lucy. Or possibly Edmund. Was it possibly Edmund? I missed that. Yes. Uh, Lewis, Lewis says in the book that they can't, they're not quite sure who it was that suggested it in the end, whether it was Lucy or whether it was Edmund. Mm. I'm going to assume Lucy. Well, Lucy works because she usually sees things that other people don't. But also Edmund used to be, well, he had quite dragonish thoughts himself for some time. So maybe he recognized that in Eustace. Ooh, yeah. And that was the part that I liked about the book better than the movie. The movie didn't have that conversation when he reveals that. Mm, Sad miss. Yes, I completely agree. (laughs) Uh, But everyone is very nice to him. And Eustace tries to write out his story on the sand, but his dragon claws aren't very good for writing. But through this entire process, we do start to see a a continued development in Eustace's character. Lewis writes, It was, however, clear to everyone that Eustace's character had been rather improved by becoming a dragon. He was anxious to help. And one day, flying slowly and wearily, but in great triumph, he bore back to camp a great tall pine tree, which had been torn up by its roots in a distant valley, and which could be made into a capital mast. And in the evening, if it turned chilly, as it sometimes did after the heavy rains, he was a comfort to everyone, for the whole party would come and sit with their backs against his hot sides and get well warmed and dried, and one puff of his fiery breath would light the most obstinate fire. Sometimes he would take a select party for a fly on his back. It really goes to show if you feel like you're someone who's gotten caught in somewhat of a monstrous state, you can still use those things, and I'll explain that in a second, for good. I mean, just think of you're someone who are fully greedy, and you spent your life for 20 years taking advantage of people, building up greed. You still have an opportunity to use those resources for good after you change your heart. You can then become stewards of that for God's kingdom. That's just an example I'm giving that's more practical today. But anything like that, you can always use those things that have turned bad for good. And the thing that reminded me of is when I go on silent retreats, because you can't speak to your fellow retreatants, you take a little bit more care with things like opening doors or even just passing the salt. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, Eustace can't speak to them, but he wants to communicate with them. And the best way he can do that is by doing nice things for them. Are you an active service love language person? Absolutely. Yep, that explains it. (laughs) However, in all of this good stuff, there is a real problem. They don't know what to do with Eustace when the time comes to leave the island. Because they're sailing out into the unknown and they've got no idea when they're going to be able to reach land again. And so Eustace is only going to be able to fly for so long. But fortunately, a little less than a week later, Edmund wakes up really early, and he meets a transformed Eustace. And Eustace tells him the story of how he turned back into a boy. He speaks about meeting this shining lion who takes him into the mountains to a garden that has this huge well. And once again, where did my mind go to? But chapter four of Till We Have Faces. Mm. Yes. With the, with the pool. Or, or the great divorce and on the top of the mountain, the fountain. Absolutely. Good catch. Uh, The lion then tells him to undress. Eustace scratches off an entire layer of his skin and peels it off like a snake. And then he does it again and then again. 
The lion then says that he's going to have to undress him. And in Eustace's story, he says, I was afraid of his claws, I can tell you, but I was pretty nearly desperate now. So he's bottomed out. He's poor in spirit in gospel terms. So I just lay flat down on my back, so a position of vulnerability, to let him do it. The very first tear he made was so deep that I thought it had gone right into my heart. Mm. We've already mentioned hearts today. Yep. It's always the heart. Always the heart. And that's where it begins. Mm-hmm. And that's where you have to get back to. Yes, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Yes. And when he began peeling the skin off, it hurt worse than anything I've ever felt. The great divorce, anyone? The man with the lizard? Mm-hmm. Then he caught hold of me and threw me into the water. It smarted like anything, but only for a moment. After that, it became perfectly delicious. And as soon as I started swimming and splashing, I found that all the pain had gone in my arm. And then I saw why. I turned into a boy again. Way better in the book than the movie. Correct answer. Mm-hmm. I was so disappointed with the movie scene of this. And I had known I was going to be disappointed because I had watched the movie scene in preparation for my talk when I was considering putting this scene in there. I read the book stuff and then watched the movie and I was like, huh, that was a letdown. <laughs> yeah, there are so many allusions in this that you miss in the movie. Yes. This is clearly a reference to baptism and all of Lewis's theology of the Zoe life, the divine life, the one that's going to transform toy soldiers into fleshy human beings. Yes. And you just can't, you can't capture that with the movie scene. And I also didn't like how I was a lion in the sand, just going like this. I mean, and I didn't like how it didn't show Eustace trying harder. It was just, it was just a quick scene and didn't show him getting anything off where I appreciated that it actually in the book argues that he did appear to short term, get things off because how often when we do try with our own effort, there is some results, but we're not bringing God into it. We tend to fall right back in. Maybe think of the scene when you cast one demon out, eight more come. It's like you feel that hopelessness that was not captured in the movie until Aslan comes. And also think of Orwell after she has had her I am Unkit moment when she sees her reflection in the mirror. She really tries to be good. And then she says, but, you know, it barely got to breakfast time before I had slipped all the way back. Yes. Once Eustace has finished the story, Edmund tells him that he's met Aslan. Aslan, said Eustace. I've heard that name mentioned several times since we joined the Dawn Treader. And I felt, I don't know what, I hated it. But I was hating everything then. And by the way, I'd like to apologize. I'm afraid I've been pretty beastly. (laughs) I I actually underlined beastly. I was clever, clever Lewis. (laughs) Yes, I thought that was really nice. (laughs) Because his transformation to a dragon was just simply an externalization of what had been going on inside his heart. Mm -hmm. And it's also worth remembering that Edmund also originally hated the name Aslan. Remember in the line that was in the wardrobe when Mr. Beaver speaks about Aslan being on the move and all of the children are excited except Edmund. Yes, good catch. Because as Lewis says in The Magician's Nephew, what you experience, what you see depends very much on where you're standing, but also with the kind of person you are. And if you have dragonish thoughts, maybe you're not going to receive the name of Aslan with joy. Yep. Edmund goes on to say, That's all right. He accepts his apology straight away. He says, and between ourselves, you haven't been as bad as I was on my first trip to Narnia. You were only an ass, but I was a traitor. See, that was missed in the movie. I mean, that's a big deal right there. That's a a cool example of just how someone like Edmund, who has been through this, can also empathize with someone else who's gone through it. Again, another example where in Christianity, when you've fallen away, no matter how great your sin is, when you come back, it is actually a powerful tool. I mean, people who have fallen into the greatest sins can really empathize with people. So don't do it intentionally, but if you're in it and you're like, there's no hope for me, yes, in fact, you could be an extraordinary tool for the kingdom because of what you've been through makes you relatable to other people. Yeah. Eustace actually asks Edmund more about Aslan. He says, who is he? Do you know him? And Edmund's response is wonderful. He says, well, he knows me. He's the great lion, the son of the emperor of the sea, who saved me and saved all Narnia. Mm. I just got to say one quick thing. No, in the scripture, when it talks about we need to know Christ, it's it's a word yada in Hebrew, and it's the same word used when a husband knows his wife on the wedding evening. And 
it's a very intimate, personal knowing. And so I find that intriguing how Edmund says, I don't know him. Because knowing is not knowing of intellectually. It's a very personal and intimate knowing. Yeah, a lot of languages have two distinct verbs for knowing. In French, it's connaître and savoir. And it's those two kinds of knowing. Spanish has the same, I believe. Conner and saber. Mm-hmm. It's the difference between knowing about and knowing. Yes. And they then return to camp and they all welcome Eustace back. And Lewis ends that chapter with something that is worth remembering. It would be nice and fairly nearly true to say that from that time forth, Eustace was a different boy. To be strictly accurate, he began to be a different boy. He had relapses. There were still many days when he could be very tiresome. But most of those I shall not notice. The cure had begun. That's a great way to end this because it's another beautiful theological truth that when we get on our journey, we're going to have transformation. Christ is going to start putting on his self in us. The divinity, the divine life is going to be coming more and more in us. But we're going to have setbacks. We're going to have relapses. Don't get despair. Don't lose hope. And keep just trusting that you're on a journey and you are being made new. You are being, I liked how he said he was undragging, but then he had to be redressed. You're being redressed, and it's a process. Fall down six times, get up seven. Yes. So as we wrap up this episode, what are your thoughts? My thoughts are I'm really glad we got through the Eustace part because that is, is so profound. And the biggest takeaway I find from this is so connected with everything we've been saying with Till We Have Faces. It's that, it's that authentic self. We can become monsters and not necessarily for bad reasons. Like the, our life circumstances, shames, hurts, wounds, our parents, as we see with Eustace, can really shape who we become. But what we have to do is eventually get that dose of truth, that self-awareness, as Eustace did, and... Once we do that, probably try on our own to get rid of it, to realize we can't, and then to surrender to Christ and his grace, and to realize that that is what we need. And we need to do that every day. It's a process, and we're going to have setbacks. Keep going, and then keep trusting that you are being made new. I'd say that's a good way to wrap up this chapter. Mm. And as usual, we want to thank all of our Patreon supporters. You guys are absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. We hope you enjoy the ministry, you guys are helping greatly do this. You should feel that um, your support does make this possible. And we want to thank particularly Rowdy and Kate, our highest ones. We have a new one, too. John. John. Um, at our highest tier, we want to thank you guys so much. And finally, please join us on Thursday when we'll be posting part two, when we'll be finishing Voyage of the Dawn Treader and be going further up and further in. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.